Dylan. And I'm Keon. And this is Trust Your Doctor, that podcast where we just create a god. Uh, because this week we watched The Mutants. Which was written by Bob Baker and Dave Martin, same uh, duo who wrote The Claws of Axos, and, and who will write The Three Doctors. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. And directed by Christopher <laughs> Barry. And aired in April and May of 1972. Continuing right off from the last serial, which is obvious that they would air right in succession, so I don't feel, I don't know why I felt the need to mention that. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, um, sure. I just want to preface this by saying I loved this serial. This is honestly one of my favorite serials, except I felt they dropped the ball in episode six. One through five were pretty much perfect. Yeah, I see. I disagree. I just thought it was kind of mediocre, and I feel it didn't hit its stride till the middle of episode five. Although I agree that episode six just pulled that ending out of... It wasn't nowhere, because they did set it up, but it felt like it was out of nowhere. Well, they set up... We'll, we'll, we'll get there. They set up part of it, but at the same time, I didn't expect them to go in the direction that they did. But But we'll get there. <laughs> Um, it starts off with, um... Some old guy just running away from some guys in a black uniform. Yeah, in a foggy, open area. Um, and they, they, the guards eventually catch up to him and kill him. Yeah. Um, and, uh, this probably isn't the right time to mention it, but the serial had a pretty good special effects budget, and, um... The sets looked really nice, and, you know, this might have been the start of it. Mm -hmm. I don't know how hard it would be to do a foggy field, but this is what, that's what it is right at the beginning. Um, Dude, it's, it's <clears throat> England. They can just go outside. <laughs> 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 hey -oh. Anyway, um, cut to the doctor and Joe, and the doctor is talking about fixing up Bessie and doing something to Bessie um, when this weird black metallic orb thing or yeah orb thing but it wasn't really an orb because it was like a low poly orb it's the best <laughs> it was... way to describe it because it wasn't smooth it was like made up of jagged surfaces in the shape of an orb right and that just uh materializes right in front of them and this was one of the first things i felt this serial did right and it's just it's a small touch but um it, it was a nice uh Nice little opener there that we never really seen the likes of before. It's just the Time Lords again. They've yeah, used, but... They did this before in Colony in Space. Yeah, but have we seen an orb that... I don't know, I like the, uh, the, um... The whole deliver the orb to the specific person who it'll open for thing. I thought that was a neat little touch. They're I not guess. just going somewhere to hopefully guess what's going on and save the day. No, well, they I mean, have this... That's basically what they're doing still. But they have this specific <laughs> objective with the orb, and then it comes into play later with the tablets, and I thought that was pretty cool. Who knows why and how the Time Lords had the tablets, but whatever. Well, I mean, the BBC website brings this up, which is just the text ripped from the discontinuity guide, but they're like, you know, this begs the question, like, why did the Time Lords just deliver the orb straight to the guy it needed to go to? Why did they need the doctor to take it? They probably just wanted to put the doctor through some more over-convoluted crap. <laughs> um. Well, yeah, so they, the doc's like, yeah, I can't open the orb because, like, it's not meant for me, apparently, so we just got to get in the TARDIS and just see where we go, and things right. will happen and everything will work out, Joe. Right, but you're not coming, Joe. <laughs> as no. usual. Well, well, I mean, not as usual. He says so, as usual, but then she ends up coming anyway as usual um but yeah if we didn't explicitly state it yet um the orb only opens for a specific person and that specific person isn't the doctor so they have to go find out who it opens for yeah and they wind up in a futuristic looking base yeah <laughs> some sort of thing set somewhere i don't know <laughs> <laughs> it's vague, but um, we find out later, I'm just going to say it now, we find out later that it's a satellite orbiting an alien planet. Yeah, something like that. Um, they call I, it Skybase right. later on. I don't know why I thought this, but I thought it was somehow connected. 
to the planet um physically hmm but interesting i don't well, think I mean, that's, that's not confirmed or denied till you see that space shot of the base in the, like episode four i think yeah the, and and that they yeah. ended it with that i wish they overlaid the credits on but whatever um <clears throat> oddly specific request but okay <laughs> but cool we only saw it for like three seconds anyway uh, yeah, and then they, like 20 in episode 6 <laughs> the really slow refueling scene but we'll get there um the the doctor and joe start meandering around the base um because no one's around so they need to find out what's up as usual so they start exploring yeah and there's uh on the base, there's like um, a conference going on, some sort of peace conference with the Salonians, and there's... Salonians are the <clears throat> indigenous yeah. inhabitants um, of the planet, by the way. Some sort of peace conference going on, and there's like an administrator guy who is administrating the conference. It's his name. <laughs> yeah, we we find out that... Um, we don't find this out till later, but I think it's necessary to explain it now that... Uh, this is in the 30th century, I believe it was, and Earth has colonized other planets, such as Solos, where this is taking place, yeah. and um, they have basically exhausted all they can. For, uh, they, they've, they've exploited Solos all they can, so they're ready to pull out, and the Earth Empire that we learn exists is on the decline, so they want to cut their losses, I guess. And yeah. pull out of Solos, and they're having this conference to decide the terms of it. Yeah. And there's two um, main Salonians who are involved in this, Kai and Varen. Mm-hmm. Varen. I, Varen. I, I think they kind of went back and forth in the pronunciation. It's Varen <clears throat> most of the time, though. Um. So, Kai, I believe... I don't know exactly why i thought this but i think it was implied that he was some sort of uh not prince but just some royal who was deposed or some sort of chief or something or or at least some form of leader who is not in uh varen's who's not part of varen's well i assume village. because varen has his own <clears throat> little village thing i assume solas is this is what i assumed is that solas is made up of a bunch of little Villages and tribes Kai, or whatever. Kai is like all mutated or something, so he's like the lost one left. I think somebody mentioned he was like one of the only ones from his tribe. Right, he mentioned that later with Joe. But I assumed like they had all mutated or something. Yeah. So we learn in this first <laughs> scene where Kai and Varen are butting heads that the Salonians are mutating into weird monster like creatures that are colloquially referred to as mutts. <clears throat> Right, by the by the humans. Yeah. Well, I think also by the Salonians, actually. Pretty sure Varen's uses, Varen uses the term. Um, yeah, well, Varen is obviously prejudiced against the mutants anyway, so... <laughs> yeah, I mean, even the Salonians dislike the mutants because... Well, they're transforming into weird bug-like creatures. Um, yeah, well, I mean, I guess we should bring this up now, since it's like a main theme, but this serial was written based on apartheid-era South Africa. Yeah. So that's why there's a lot of comparisons to be drawn between the the humans and you know the whites of apartheid of south africa and then obviously they've got segregated transport systems which will come up in a second that one side is for the overlords and the other is for the salonians you got know. your oxy mask on <laughs> i just couldn't stop staring at that sign whenever it showed up um, um but originally apparently it was a lot more overt the the uh parallels but Barry Letts was like, yo, we got to tone it down a bit. <laughs> I, re- I read that he just wanted a more sci-fi focused serial. Yeah, um, which also involved toning it down a bit. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I also read that, and I didn't know this when we watched it, but <clears throat> God, and now I'm blanking on the name. Um, there was another serial based on apartheid. apartheid. Well, it, it, it wasn't it. based on apartheid. It was based on like Native American colonization. No, no, it wasn't um, Colony in Space. space. It was an, there was oh, the another savages. one. You're right, the Savages, way back in the first Doctor. The one where <laughs> Stephen decides to just become king at the end. <laughs> Except that one was a lot less obvious than this one is. This one is like 
pretty hit you over the head with the the theme. Well, yeah, it's it's at least more blatantly obvious than the savages. Yeah, I'll say that. Um, but right. Anyway, Kai and Varen are butting heads because Kai just doesn't trust the humans whatsoever. Whereas mm-hmm. Varen's entered a sort of deal with them, an yeah. underhanded deal, as we learn <laughs> later, but but a deal uh, nonetheless. But Kai just outright hates all the humans, which is understandable because they arrived at Solos, exploited it for its minerals, and then kind of just want to back out. <coughs> they don't even want to back out. They want to turn Solos into an Earth habitable, an Earth type planet. So basically, kill off all the Solonians anyway. Well, the marshal wants to do that. Yeah. The administrator. We don't learn well. The administrator doesn't really have any motives. He's just kind of there to get assassinated at <laughs> yeah, peace basically. conference. For all we know, he could he could want uh Solos to be uh terraformed. I don't think terraform is the right word, but uh atmospherized. <laughs> That's not even a real word. <laughs> <laughs> Atmosphere. Um Well anyway, there is an announcement over the intercom that there's been an intrusion in Sector 4, which turns out that's where the Doctor and Joe are. Turns out it's actually Sector 9, but that comes up no. way later. <laughs> that's never revealed. It just looks like a 9 on the wall. Um, which is weird, because when they switch to Sector 5, which is where Stubbs and Cotton are when they get the message, it looks definitely, clearly like a 5, but I guess they just didn't have the budget to make 4 look like a 4. Well, no, the 5 was clearly an S. No, 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 no. <laughs> um, Dang, you must yeah, have been on some heavy drugs while watching this. <laughs> Wait, they didn't have the budget to make the nine look like a four? I don't Implying know. Implying that it's harder to make a four than a nine? <laughs> four does have less lines than a nine. Which would imply that it's easier to create a four than a nine. Maybe they already had a nine <laughs> sitting around and they're like, we don't want to make this into a four. But it looked like it was painted onto the set. <laughs> yeah, it looks like it was in the same font as like the War Machine's opening, though. Yeah, it did. Um... Either way, genetic sci-fi plot number has one. Nothing to do with the serial, but um, it has everything to do with the serial. But yes, yeah, Scubs and Cotton. Who, I thought Stubbs. Was, yeah, I thought his name was Scubs for the I entire. I thought it was Stubson. So, well, <laughs> well, Cotton called him Stubsy. Uh, I guess because they were best buddies. Um, but I loved Stubbs and Cotton. Yeah, you know, apparently Stubbs and Cotton are pretty polarizing characters because some people think their acting just sucked and they just couldn't act for, (laughs) you know, scraps. And then some people thought they were the most nuanced characters in the whole series, so... Well, I won't argue that their acting was all that great. Because I didn't think it was. Especially Cotton. (laughs) Wait a minute, we're in the fuel room! (laughs) Uh, Accurate. (laughs) Accurate. (laughs) Anyway, um they were just the com- comedic relief of this serial and they they were the Benton and Yates of this serial except they were way more awesome because they were guards but they weren't incompetent. Well, Ben Yates's shtick is to be incompetent, so you can't really Well, they were the Benton and Yates in that they were the comic relief duo of this serial. Okay, cuz I was going to say you can't really compare them cuz Benton and Yates are <laughs> meant to be incompetent. Like that's their thing. <laughs> Whereas Cotton and Stubbs are meant not to be incompetent. Yeah, I, mean, I just meant that, uh, you know, their inclusion yeah. might have been uh, that they wanted to add a Benton and Yates type dynamic to this serial. And when yeah. they couldn't because... Which the, briefly touches on the fact that the big Benton and Yates don't appear in this serial again. Right. We've gone four serials now without word mm. from Big Yenton. Yent? <laughs> Yenton. <laughs> Yates and Benton. Um, right, they haven't appeared since Day of the Daleks, in which they played a very minor role. So I'm still hoping that they get their, use the expression again, time in the sun. Probably next <laughs> week. Or during the Three Doctors, you know, because, I mean, I don't think Jamie and Susan decide to show up, unless they do, which would be better, to be honest, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> um... Well, I know when the Doctor's exile on Earth ends, but I'm not going to uh, mention anything about that. Yep. Yeah, if you looked at ChannonSullivan.net, it's like 
blatantly right there at the top of the page. <laughs> just, so, just in case anyone wanted to know. But anyway, um, Where so yeah, we? the doctor is going to the, the like conference thing. He sees the conference going on. He's like, I gotta, I gotta get in there. I'm like from Earth and stuff. And the right. guard's not letting him. He's like, nope, sorry, you don't have pulses. Eh. So inside, the uh, the administrator gets assassinated by Varen, I think. Yeah, the, uh, you, we find out later that, uh, and I didn't exactly get this while watching the episode. Um, it wasn't a huge detriment to understanding the plot. But we find out that Varen has is, is, uh, been plotting behind the scenes with the Marshal, who I don't think we've mentioned yet. No. Who is... Well, we vaguely mentioned his plan was to re-atmospherize the <laughs> Yeah. So the marshal is a marshal on, on Skybase, obviously. And uh, he has his own agenda, different from the administrator. Mm -hmm. He basically just wants to kill off all the Salonians in order to make Solas's atmosphere more hospitable. Because if we didn't mention it... So uh, humans can't breathe the Salonian atmosphere, and that's briefly touched upon in the first scene, um, where the marshal and the guards, who I think were Scubs and Scubs and Cotton, yeah, I'm not Stubbs sure. And um, they were wearing masks in the fog, mm -hmm. and they I think they took off their mask. One of them took off his mask, and the other uh, reminded him to put it back on or something like that. Yeah, um, I think the marshal took off his mask. Because it was the Marshall and Stubbs and Cotton. Yeah. Down down at the beginning. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I don't exactly remember, but... but anyway, the, the administrator just gets assassinated <clears throat> and um, Kai makes a break from the room. Uh, the doctor's standing outside and he accidentally touches the orb and it starts opening. The doctor's like, wait, this is for you. Come back. Um, and then he, this Kai kidnaps Joe because Joe runs after him. He's just like, well, you're my prisoner now. Let's go. We're going down <laughs> to the surface. Mm. That's how episode one ends. <laughs> yeah, we forgot the scene where Stubbs and Cotton are supposed to go investigate the disturbance in Sector 4, but they're playing checkers or something, or uh, I think it was chess, actually. And uh, I think Cotton convinces Stubbs to just stay <clears throat> and keep playing, and they, they uh, announce over the intercom again that they need to go this time, <laughs> so they eventually make their way over there. <clears throat> Yeah. I like that they're they have that comic relief aspect, but they're also pretty cool characters in the end. Subpar acting aside, <laughs> Stubbs is a little better than Cotton, but not by much. <clears throat> Slides were so flat, <laughs> but anyway. So episode <laughs> two begins as usual, right where episode one ends. And I just want to say this wasn't exactly the best example of it, but I liked the cliffhangers in this serial. Most of them weren't... Most Except them... that one where they just got out of by defying all laws of physics ever, but we'll get there. <coughs> we'll get there. Which one was that? The one where they blow a hole in the side of sky base. Oh, uh, that, that, <coughs> that was my favorite one. The, that literally <laughs> defies all laws of physics ever. They would, yeah. all, they would have been all been dead. Yeah, but it doesn't need to make sense. They tried so hard to make sense of the whole rest of the serial and then just threw it all away in the one cliffhanger. Well, at the end... And in the end, <laughs> they, just, they just threw it all away. They tried so hard, and then they're like, you know what? No. <laughs> I don't know. I didn't mind that the... We'll, we'll get there. But um, yeah, let's not get ahead of ourselves like we usually do. Anyway, in episode two, Joe and Kai make their way back down to the surface. Not back down, but down to the surface of Solas. Um, mm -hmm. And when they get there, this is a little bit later, but Kai... Mentions that Joe's probably going to die, so I don't know why he didn't take a mask with him. Uh, Have you got your oxy mask? <laughs> right, we should probably mention that, because I mentioned it before, that um, on the uh, right on the teleporter... that The T-Mat. Yeah, the wiki mentions that it was T-Mat, <laughs> which is a throwback to the Seeds of Death, <laughs> but I don't think it was ever specifically called T-Mat in the serial. It was called a Trance Mat. Okay, so not necessarily the same thing. Yeah, I we think can't it's... verify. Didn't they call the T-Mat Transmat in the Seeds of Death? I don't think so. I don't think they ever referred to it as Transmat. Hmm. Um, but yeah, it's probably the same thing. Um, but right on the teleporter, 
since the humans can't breathe the Salonian atmosphere, there's this sign that says, have you got your oxy mask? And whenever the scenes with the teleporter in them are pretty prominent, and whenever they showed up, I just couldn't stop reading that the sign over and over and over again. <laughs> um, but either way, Kai doesn't take a mask for Joe, which is kind of dumb of him, but at the same time makes sense because they're in a rush and they're being pursued by guards. And also he wants to use Joe's collateral. Which would make me assume that he would take the mask. Instead now, of him not. taking him not taking it would make more sense though, because it would put an element of time pressure on the overlords to make a decision. Whereas taking a mask kind of gives the overlords like, oh, you know, we have all the time in the world. Like she's got a mask, she'll survive for like as long as we need her, unless um, he decides to kill her, which he probably wouldn't do because she's his asset. Exactly. Whereas putting the death out of his hands kind of puts time pressure on the overlords to you know do something. If yeah, that was his plan. I guess he didn't take into account, and I don't blame him since there, he was in such a rush, and this all happened in about two minutes. That you know, if the if the Overlord slash Earthlings, we we didn't mention that the Earthlings are actually referred to as Overlords by the Salonians, so there's that. But if they weren't planning on rescuing Joe anyway, then then his death isn't really, then her death isn't really on his hands because it was like. Yeah, you sh- you should have known to take him off, and I, he, he could just pawn it off onto her, and then she dies, and then he's I, I, free of all guilt. I guess, but based on Kai's character, I wouldn't think that he would want to do that. But whatever. Doesn't Kai just want to straight up kill Van the first time he shows up? He doesn't want to. He doesn't want to indiscriminately kill everyone, though. He does mention like, "Hey, Joe and the Doctor, you're from Earth, but you know you're different. You're not Overlords." Because, because, yeah, because they're not Overlords. He still wants to. He wants to take out his enemies. It's not like he's nah. going around spouting love and peace everywhere. But nah. I, anyway. So they've got Joe. He's got Joe. And the doctor's like, we got to go get Joe. And the marshal's like, yeah, no. Not <laughs> happening. Understandably, yeah. And the marshal has commandeered control of the base now that um, the, the administrator's dead. Yeah. Uh, so he's put his plan into motion. I guess there's no one above him. No. Uh, so he's now put his plan into motion to uh, change the atmosphere of Solos into Professor Jaeger on it. Right. Professor Mainly Jaeger. German. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Mainly because his name is spelled J-A-E-G-E-R. Yeah. It's a German name, <laughs> I believe. <laughs> um, well, we're not linguists, so I don't know. Maybe it's like Swedish or something. But he does have a distinctly Dutch. German accent, so... <clears throat> Um, the doctor has shown the marshal the orb thing and has mentioned he can't open it because it's because it's meant for Kai. But the marshal wants to know what's inside, so he tells the doctor to go work with Jaeger on opening the sphere thing. Well, they have that whole scene where they're about to try and blow it open. That's not really important though. Looking back onto it, well, that's in their attempts to open it up. Yeah, and the doctor mentions that. If because they call the doctor a saboteur, but he mentions that if he were a saboteur, the the device would have been a bomb and they would have just exploded themselves. Um, but yeah, back on Solos, uh, Joe and Kai have made their way into some some caves, and I guess before we get into it, I can mention the caves because this isn't really pertinent here. Not pertinent, but prominent. This isn't really prominent here, but later on, these caves get pretty trippy and i don't know i liked the sort of phosphorescent luminescent it was the thesium radiation yeah i mean i i liked what they did and i thought that they uh did a good job with uh special effects on these caves they had a i almost i want to say aurora borealis like it was just multicolored rainbow yeah which comes I back mean, later in episode six on the, the transcendental being i uh, anyway. i liked what they were going for but um I guess this was just a limitation of the budget at the time. I wrote down a note like, is it supposed to look like really bad green screen? Because that's what it looks like. It looks like really bad green screen right now. Well, it's 72. <clears> I thought they did a good job. Actually. I mean, uh, yeah, it was probably limitation of. I, I they, think. So, but hmm, never mind. I think if we weren't it's not used worth, to. It's not worth it. Anyway, modern... moving on. Moving on. Um, we're not even at the caves yet. We're not even at the Technicolor caves yet. Right. Um, we're at the normal <clears> caves. I thought the. The the less luminescent caves still had a touch of, of that to them. Yeah, they were kind of greenish. 
Maybe they reuse the Silurian base again. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> anyway, the um, the Doctor and Jaeger are working on this particle reverser. <laughs> to open up the container. Which <clears throat> is like just the magic plot device of the serial. Because right, it can do everything, but right now it's meant to turn the inside of the orb outside. Which it works for like a second and then it doesn't blows up the machine and the doc's like well did you see what it was and Jaeger's like nope but you know this idea of particle reversal could be useful for terraforming or changing the atmosphere of the planet doctor and he's like yeah no not doing it but um well actually I guess he does because he realizes it's his only way out they bla- they basically blackmail the doctor into doing their bidding for the entire serial Pretty much. Well, a couple times in particular. But uh, throughout all of this, well, it happens once and then it happens again. But the Doctor wonders if there are any scientists who, from Earth who have studied Solos or if it's just all military guys. And I think Professor Jaeger mentions this guy named Sondegard. Best who, named character. <laughs> I don't know, his name's pretty fun to say. Professor Sondegard. I think it's actually Sondergard. Um, Sondegard. But yeah, I'm just going to call him Sondegard because it sounds cool. <laughs> um, sounds exactly the same. No, Sondegard? Sondergard? Yeah, you're just putting emphasis on the second I'm syllable. putting emphasis on the R because I have an American accent. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sondegard. Anyway, Jaeger mentions Sondegard, who hmm. was a scientist who came to study Solos, or its culture at least. Uh, but went missing mm-hmm. years before the serial takes place. And that's another thing I liked about the serial. It had a lot of lore. Yeah. Uh, at least in comparison to other serials. You know, it wasn't like, it wasn't something like Dune where there's like thousands of years of history, but... Hey, but I liked that in Dune. <laughs> yeah, I did too. But um, <laughs> it wasn't anything that in-depth, but it had more lore than other serials, which I liked. Uh, yeah. Probably because they were... Uh trying more overtly to draw from real world situations and they just expanded it to explain it all but anyway yeah no i liked i also liked that the salonians were a bit more in depth um than other alien races until the end where they just well i don't think the end undermines that i think the end undermines the serial but i don't think the it undermines the uh depth of the salonians or how they're characterized but not characterized but how their races portrayed um but yeah we'll get into that divisive ending i feel like their race was kind of undermined by the fact that no one spoke their language anymore why that 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 kind of adds to it you know they since earth invaded they lost their original language that and that kind of parallels you know the real world uh situ situ colonialism where you know the usually the europeans would force who they were, the people they were colonizing not to speak their own language anymore. Yeah, I suppose. <clears throat> but, mm, I don't know, I just thought that was kind of just weird. I was like, well, wouldn't they at least have some sort of written language just to defy the overlords? Like, wouldn't they make some sort of effort to do it just so they could communicate without the overlords knowing? Like, because, you know, that happened too in colonial in the US, times. Well, in-, in the US, you know. Yeah, I don't know much about the situation in South Africa. Uh, obviously, you know way more than me, but uh, I know just drawing on what I know about, uh, like Native Americans in the mm. in the U.S. That, uh, well, I know like in the in in school in uh boarding schools where they you know they would take the Native American children to the boarding schools to mm-hmm. quote unquote Americanize them. Um, and, you know, they'd just beat them if they spoke a word of their original language. You know, that's kind of... It was kind of uh, beaten out of them. Uh, yes. Um, it's never really explained. Yeah, it's, it's just like, oh, yeah, we can't speak it anymore. Or at least they can't read it. Maybe they maybe they can speak it, but maybe no one knows how to read it I guess it's not anymore. touched on whether they can speak it or not, so they might be able to just... I mean, Kai doesn't have anyone to speak it to in this serial except Varen, who decides to go on his own <laughs> and thing. And what's interesting is that... We don't know whether or not the Salonians are speaking English or not. Presumably they can communicate with the overlords, but who knows if they 
speak if they if they're bilingual or something like that. Or you could just go off the thing they introduced in the reboot that the TARDIS automatically translates all languages for anyone who travels in it, so they're all not talking English in this serial and yeah, just translated that, for them. That's exactly what we don't know. We never know that. Yeah. But at the same time, you know, that that's why we don't know. You know, maybe they actually are legit speaking English here. Presumably a very different form of English than what we know today because it's yeah, in it's the, 30th the 30th century. century. Um, uh, but yeah, so Joe is... They've, they've made it to the caves, Joe and Kai. And Kai also mentions Sondegard, I believe. Briefly. Um, he kind of says, oh yeah, this guy came, he was named Sondegard and he studied us, but now he's missing. Yeah. Uh... And they all, he also mentions the mutants, how they've been... Mm-hmm. Uh, that we already explained it. I think this is where, if you were watching the serial, you would really learn more about it. Um, you know, the mutations that the Solonians have been undergoing. And they assume that it's because of the atmosphere experiments that have been going on, which is a reasonable assumption to make. And is pretty much correct, as we find out later, but... Uh, well, h- half correct. Essentially. Which is, like, mostly correct. It's mostly <laughs> correct. Because the mutations were caused by the atmosphere because they started prematurely because of the atmosphere, which basically they caused the... Yeah, uh, well, we learned that they would have occurred anyway, but we'll, yeah, but we'll get into that. They were, they were started prematurely by the... Yeah. So anyway, the doctor is blackmailed into <laughs> helping them, you know, change the atmosphere, and he hooks up the device to the main power frame of Skybase and blows it out and makes an escape for it, thanks to Stubbs and Cotton um, kind of distracting the Marshal for a bit. Yes, yeah, the Doctor informs Stubbs and Cotton of the Marshal's misdeeds, and they they quickly turn sides to the Doctor. Yeah, and uh, we pretty- forgot to mention the Marshal has killed Varen's son and was going to kill Varen, and it's revealed that Varen was working for the Marshal when he assassinated the Administrator. Right, and Varen... Also makes this, a break for it. Yeah, well, up to this point, he's sort of been sneaking about the base. Um, <clears throat> and, but yeah, uh, they, make it, they make it to the surface um, also together. the doc, uh, Varen kind of threatens the Doctor, as did Kai, did, as Kai did to Joe... But they're like, well, we both need to find... You need to find Kai. I need to find Joe. Like, let's work together. Yeah, probably together, so... Yeah. Uh, they go on this grand search for Kai and Joe. Meanwhile, and they- Kai and Joe have ventured not much deep into the cave when a mutant shows up, and... Well, a whole horde of mutants. Well, one well, at no, first, and then yeah. a whole horde of them. Yeah. <clears throat> so and Kai decides that he needs to fend them off. Uh, and he does so with fire, mm-hmm. um, while Joe makes a run for it, deeper into the caves. Um, I, I guess, I didn't really think about it while watching the episode, but I guess this, she can breathe the air in the caves? Was that yeah, what it was? no, Stubbs mentioned, uh, not Stubbs, uh, Kai mentions that in the cave, that it's, because Kai mentions that it's the sun that makes the atmosphere unbreathable, so in the caves uh, okay. where the sun doesn't shine the air is breathable for joe for an right. indefinite yeah. amount of time that makes sense um <clears throat> or as much sense as is needed to understand what's going on but yeah so kai stays behind joe goes off on her own and the doctor and uh let's Varen. say Varen arrive at the caves and they see the fire that uh joe and kai had been sitting around before so they know they're on the right track um, and joe runs into the technical cave <laughs> and collapses and sees this mysterious gray metallic being moving towards her and then she not gets knocked out i guess by the you yeah. find you find out later it's the radiation i'm just gonna say it now because i'm gonna forget to mention it later but <laughs> um the, she gets knocked out because of the radiation in that cave yeah this which was, is also why it looks technical <laughs> yeah and this was the first introduction of that the the whole you know technicolor <laughs> cave which i thought looked nice i mean we touched it looks on it cool before. it's but it wasn't like, impressive it wasn't really by bad modern screen. standards, yeah. but... And I don't know. The reason I keep calling it Technicolor is because the end, when the thing happens, I just kept thinking of, like, what's that musical, like, John and the Technicolor Dreamcoat? Yeah, uh... <laughs> what's it? Joseph. Oh, yeah, Joseph think... and the Technicolor Dreamcoat. That's all I could... I could just... I mean, I haven't seen that musical, but that title is just all I could think it's, of in the in the end. It's biblical, it's uh, cause you know, cause the you know the coat of many colors, 
Yeah. That's what it's a reference to, and I didn't know that until recently, actually. I didn't but... know that all right now. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, that's all I could think of during the end. And there are a lot of bi- biblical references in this, which we'll get to. Like, the tablets the tablets are referred to as the Salonians' book of Genesis. Was, wasn't that the only one? I didn't notice any... I'm not too familiar well, I mean, with the Bible. Well, I mean, besides so. Kai just basically coming back from the dead to be this... Oh, yeah, you know, Kai's... I didn't you know. think that was necessarily a biblical reference, though, but we again, we're getting way ahead of ourselves. So Joe gets knocked out, and she sees the metallic being. Yeah. And then the Doctor and Varen find Kai fending off the mutants, I guess. And the Doctor and Varen meet up with Kai, and they're like, yo, where's Joe? And they go to find Joe and don't find us, so and now they gotta... <laughs> Search through the whole caves to find Joe. Meanwhile, the marshal's like, hey, you know, it'd be a great idea to remove a lot of mutants. Let's bomb those caves. <laughs> well, he sends scu- uh, Stubbs. I keep wanting to call him Scubs. Uh, Stubbs and Cotton down to go look for the doctor. Right. Um, and he calls Stubbs and Cotton into his... It wasn't his office. He just called them in to talk with them somewhere. And they they were like, oh, crap. He knows we've defected. But no, he, he doesn't. Um, he sends them down to go look I for the doctor. I think he does. Maybe. We don't know. I think he knows later. He knows later. He definitely knows well, later. I think but... he knows as, as early as when Stubbs and Cotton go into the mine to find the doctor. Well, yeah. He, that's, when, that's when he undisputably finds out, indisputably. But we don't know if he knows yet. He might. I think he knows. But anyway, yeah, yeah they go might, down yeah. and they they uh, start placing the like bombs that would cause the cave in that would seal in everybody, and they're gonna chuck gas grenades in to just basically gas out the <laughs> mines. Uh, but Stubbs and Cotton, obviously, since they're working for the Doctor or with the Doctor, um, you know, they meet up with them and they tell them about the Marshal's plan. Yeah, they like they like Marshall. We got to go. And they go in, and the Marshal's like, "Well, just bomb them." <laughs> they're like, wait, but Stubbs and Cotton are inside. He's like, perfect. <laughs> so they begin the bombardment in episode three ends. Uh, dun, as, dun. as also the metallic figure appears again. And right. they're like, what? To save them. Yeah, and the metallic figure saves him, takes him to this weird underground base that he's either built or found. Um, and it's revealed that it's Sondergaard. Dun, dun. He has this, there's this dramatic scene where he pulls off his helmet and... I don't know why I assume this because it doesn't make sense at all. But I was half I was half expecting it to be the master when he pulled off what? the helmet, um, just because there have been uh, a couple times in the past where, uh, you, you know, like in Colony in Space, where oh the uh, adjudicator is coming, and then all of a sudden it turns out to be the master. I thought it was yeah, but that one you could see like coming from a mile away. I didn't see that one coming from a mile away, so I was like, you know, I'm gonna anticipate this. No, it wasn't. <laughs> it was Sondergaard. <laughs> Deus Ex Master. <laughs> No, Sondergaard. Um, it would be really weird if the monster, like, saved the Doctor. Like, his whole point is to, like, destroy Earth and the Doctor, and, like, step one to destroying the Earth is to destroy the Doctor. Well, obviously, this t- serial would have taken a turn for the completely different if it had been the Master, but but no, it's not, so... <laughs> it's Sondergaard, who's, uh... been exposed to so much radiation over the years that he ha- no longer has any hair. He's completely bald and Does has he no eyebrows. That? No, but he's completely bald and he has no eyebrows. And Maybe he's... he was just bald before going there. With and just completely bald, no eyebrows, nothing. He, he has he, eyebrows. No, he doesn't. Yes, he does. No, he doesn't. Yes, he does. No, he doesn't. He mentions that he's been around radiation. And he's kind of used to it by now. He's got eyebrows right there. <laughs> no, they're not. I, okay, they did a poor job of shaving them off then. Or covering them up. He's not supposed to have eyebrows. And, I, and honestly, in the picture we're looking at right now, I don't see much indication that he does have eyebrows. But well, still, he, he might have been a... bald before coming to Solos. You could just assume it was the radiation that made him bald. He has a radiation suit, which is why he can rescue them. He's still been around radiation for years and upon years. It's not like he's wearing the suit 24-7. Yeah, but Either there's no way, radiation in his base, and he specifically mentions that. I do think that... It was a subtle touch that they made him bald and eyebrowless because because of this. I, I mean, obviously we can't confirm one way or the other, so I'm not saying I'm flat out I think they were going for right. like a kind of like bald monk in the mountains type thing with Sondergaard. Like he's the all-knowing maybe kind some, of monk in the Yeah, no, maybe the was, base. That's, that's a good point. Maybe there's some sort of double entendre with that. 
Um, but anyway, Sondergaard is like, yeah, I've been studying them for years, and the mutants are my friends, and I've been saving them. But now there's so many of them, they realize they can just overwhelm me, so they're not my friends anymore. Or so <laughs> he thinks. But anyway. Um, yeah, they're all surprised that Sondergaard isn't dead. Um, understandably. And at this point, Ka- uh, the Doctor still has the orb, which he's just been carrying around oh, yeah. for <laughs> three episodes. He hasn't had much opportunity to do anything with it, but now he's finally with Kai, so they can finally open it and find out what's inside. And Kai opens it, and, and they're like, great. he's pissed that it's not weapons that he can use to overwhelm the overlords. No, it's just some stone tablets. Yeah, oh, we've got to mention that Varen has, like, been... He's noped out of the group to go find his village to basically stage an all-out assault on the sky base. Right. Do we ever see that assault? I don't think we do. I think they just disappear from the village, and then we just don't see him again until Varen... Oh, yeah, Varen goes to the base, yeah. but we only see Varen... They definitely get... they attack the base. They go to the base, and they have that... It's not like a, an all-out assault, but they have that shootout. Hmm. And the part where Varen dies. Spoiler. <laughs> um, this whole show is n- a spoiler. Not that... That I don't think it was... I don't think the fact that we didn't see a large-scale battle was unfitting because there weren't that many villagers. It was Varen and just a couple other guys. No, I was just wondering if we even saw a battle at all because I couldn't remember if there was... Yeah, it was just... Even a they, they get... Thing. They do get... They get overwhelmed and then right before that thing happens that you didn't like. Um, anyway, uh, Sondergaard reveals that he might know some things about the tablets. Right, Kai looks at them and well, he gives them a quick look and he mentions what we were talking about before, that they're written in the ancient Salonian script that no one can read anymore. And earlier, a plot thread had been started where so- uh, Jaeger had mentioned that Solas, every, after every experiment, the heat of Solas had been going up and not down, uh, coming down at any point. So Solas must be entering summer and they must have 200 year seasons. And you're like, why would they introduce that plot point? And 500 then, year seasons. Yeah. It was 500. Okay. And then it comes back into play uh, now when the, doc- the doctor and Sunday go to examining the tablets, and the Sunday goes, like, but it doesn't make sense. Like, we're not in summer, it's spring. And the doctor's like, well, I guess the seasons are 500 years long, man. Yeah, well, we didn't mention that they're, you know, they're trying to decipher what the tablets are, and they, they come up with all these theories, and they're wrong, and they realize they're wrong because they don't uh, make sense or hold up. But then they realize the tablets are actually a, a primitive calendar. For Solas, mm. and they depict what happens in each season, which is a major event on Solas because the seasons are five hundred years long. So, the the mutants only start to appear in summer. Yeah, which is interesting for now. And I actually liked you mentioned that they set up the five hundred year seasons thing before, and and we also mentioned how they set up Sondegard before mm-hmm. he showed up. And I liked that they did things like that in this serial because it made it felt made it the pacing feel more modern. Where you know they might set yeah. up some sort of mystery and they'd go into an action sequence and they wouldn't really reveal what it is right away and you it just creates more suspense. Yeah, uh, which I liked, and and the whole thing with the you know you don't know what's in the the orb container thing until Kai opens it and you find that appears in episode one and you don't get what it is until episode four. Yeah, um, which I liked. Anyway, the Doctor and Sondergaard realize they need to go get this crystal out of that. Technicolor cave. Right, because I think it was depicted on the tablets. Yeah. In uh next to the mutants, so they realize it must have some sort of connection, so they need to go get it. But uh the doctor goes in with Sondergaard. Sondergaard doesn't make it all the way into the cave because the radiation overwhelms him and then the doctor Even goes suit. all the way to the, the crystal and gets it in the middle of the radiation. Now I'm not gonna say anything, but given a certain scene in the tenth doctor's run, this scene loses a lot of of credibility, but anyway. Well, um, wouldn't it be the other way around? The scene in the 10th Doctor's run loses credibility because of this? Depending which way you want to look at it, I guess. <laughs> they both lose credibility because of each other. <laughs> the, hmm. Without spoiling anything, the 10th Doctor says this monologue before the scene, which implies things that would undermine this scene. Um, well, we'll talk about that in three years, but... <laughs> Uh, but Maybe. anyway, <laughs> the Doctor takes the crystal back to Sondergaard, and... They start to study it, I guess. And meanwhile, before they even went to the caves, Joe, Kai, and everyone else has 
gone out this emergency back exit, which right. is like a hole in the ceiling. <laughs> um, they confront some guards who'd been sent from Skybase. Um, mm -hmm. And Stubbs is like, it's me, Stubbs. You don't want to shoot me. And they're like, yes, we do. So they overpower the guards and... And they kill Stubbs. That's not, that's not yet. Is it? He doesn't get killed in the caves. He gets killed on Skybase. He gets killed in episode five. Um... But yeah, now. But, uh, but Stubbs dies anyway because they later. go back to the sky base because they get captured when they get to the surface. But uh, we also didn't mention that the marshal has uh, bugged in some way or the other. It's never explained. Stubbs and Cotton, and now knows, now one hundred percent knows about their mutiny, <laughs> uh, which is why he orders them killed. Obviously. Yeah, but the doctor and Sondergaard then are like, "Well, we better go." meet up with the other, the, you know, Joe, Kai, Stubbs, and Cotton. They get to Varen's base, and they're not there, so they're like, well, if they're the, not the here... Village. Yeah, they're probably on Sky Base, because yeah. they probably got captured. Uh, I liked what why, uh, the way the village looked. I think it was a set. It was a, It was supposed to be... Out, it was. It's a village, so obviously it's outdoors. I think it was a set, though. I'm pretty sure yeah, it looked like I'm a set. certain And it we was. only saw it from one angle, so... Um, but I thought it looked... Pretty nice. It was. It looked very desolate, which was fitting. And yeah, well, I mean, it just I mean, looked they run all down. had left. Yeah, it just looked run down, which I liked. Uh, you liked a lot of things in this serial. It's better if you just said what you didn't like. Episode six. So anyway, <laughs> the doctor and Sondergaard. Sondergaard um, stays behind, and the doctor goes to Skybase with the crystal. Yeah. Uh, um, meanwhile, the bombardments are still going on. Because uh, the the doctor and well no Joe and Cotton after Stubbs has been killed have there, there's a an investigator from Earth coming to investigate Skybase and Joe and Cotton have managed to overpower the guards holding them and get a message to them accusing the marshal of basically destroying the planet so to speak yeah this is in episode five now yeah um. Well, episode, yeah. Well, episode four ends with our intrepid group in, like, a room, and the marshal decides to just shoot at Varen, misses, blows a hole in Sky Base, and then everyone almost gets sucked out, but only Varen flies out of the hole. Right, Varen's... Well, Varen's invasion force comes into Sky Base. His invasion force of, like, six. But, uh, <laughs> I guess I was unsure while watching this, because it's kind of ambiguous, or they didn't really portray it that well. Um... I guess Varen's half-mutated villagers kind of just die. Uh, they're shot or something. Uh, and then the whole thing happens where Varen just gets shot out into space, a la Katarina. Um, oh, now there's a throwback. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I, I kind of liked... Well, I'll at least talk about the special effects in the scene first. I liked the space scene. I thought it looked nice. It was possible. It was better than the ones we've seen before. I don't know, I thought, I thought it looked, uh, putting myself in, obviously I wasn't alive in 72, so I can't put myself back in that time period, but, um, I felt, uh, for such, uh, well, I, I felt for the, for the time, it probably would have looked nice. Yeah, I, uh, I just feel like a lot of the special effects in this seal suffered because the Sea Devils also overran on budget, and they might have drawn some from this serial too. Did you think the special effects were too abrasive, maybe? I didn't, but I'm just wondering maybe that's why you didn't like them. Because they were a little bit over... They could could be considered over the top. I just felt like we've seen better on the show. And I felt like something caused them to suffer in this serial because of that. Well, I... And the reason I see... I mean, we specifically saw better right in the end. Like, you know, the evolution and then the thing that was like some of the best special effects we've seen so far but then like the rest of the sea was kind of like yeah what well they they obviously have to budget it out um but i don't know i like the visual style they were going for with the rainbow i don't want to call it a motif but <laughs> motif uh -huh. well it was because it was the radiation the radiation was rainbow and the radiation is what i, I guess uh but anyway yeah the only varin flies out of the airlock and then like it wasn't, it's not an airlock, it's just literally well, the, a hole the in the hole, ship. And somehow ship. everybody else Eddies. survives, which makes zero <laughs> sense because they should have been blown out into space regardless of whether or not they had a handhold because that force would have been far too strong for them to hold on to anything. 
Yeah, I didn't. I didn't find too much problem with that. Well, I, I, mean, I mean, I did. It, it, I did. Uh, it was the reason the problem is so blatant is because, like in episode five, they literally basically just stand up and walk out. That is basically what they do. <laughs> yeah, well, they could have made more of an effort to make it look like they were struggling to get out. It's just they kind of just cop down, like, yeah, we're just gonna stand up and leave now. Yeah, well, it's kind of the same thing they did in the mind robber. I think it was where the TARDIS is on its side and. Jamie, Zoe, and the Doctor are supposed to be clinging at handholds, but they're obviously just flailing around flat on the ground. <laughs> so it's kind of one of those situations where you just have to go, I know I've been praising the special effects and stuff in this serial, but you kind of just have to go, okay, they were working with limited technology, so, uh, you know, they did what they could. Well, even if they had, like, been they fla- made it better. flailing around on the ground to get out, that would have been made more sense i think that my problem with it is that they just kind of just stood up and walked out which like in no interpretation of the scene would make sense like even the like even a kid could understand that that doesn't make sense especially since they just saw varen fly out of the ship well yeah i guess they did cop out a little bit here um i didn't particularly mind though anyway yeah so they get the call out to the investigator the investigator's coming the doctor gets to the tea mat and joe tells the marshal that hey you better get your crap together because uh the doctor is working with the investigator which is a lie um and you're gonna get in trouble when they realize you've commandeered everything and utilized the base for your own purposes so the marshal responds by well there's the whole thing where he locks them up and they escape and the uh, stubs god dies uh the marshal shoots him uh, the, he orders the other guards to shoot him, but they're reluctant, so he does it himself. And then he imprisons Cotton, Kai, and Joe mm-hmm. in the uh, refueling bay, which is where the investigator's ship is going to dock to refuel for its trip back to Earth. Well, he doesn't put them there yet because the doctor tries to break them out and the, they capture the doctor and force him to start working on the particle reversal machine again because Jaeger had um the marshal basically forced Jaeger's hand into bombing the planet with this missile that was his original plan for changing the atmosphere and then one of the best lines in the show comes up where he's like this isn't a war this is a scientific bombardment (laughs) of a planet I think it was uh scientific use of ballistics or something like that yeah something like that um scientific (laughs) application of ballistics yeah um, interesting. But Marshall's like, yeah, I don't care, just do it. <laughs> and he messed up, and Marshall's trying to cover his backside because the investigator's going to come uh, and going to see that, so the doc- he-, he forces the doctor to help Jaeger to fix the thing. Right, that's basically the Marshall's modus operandi for the whole serial, is rush into things blindly, don't plan anything, and then try and cover your tracks when it all goes horribly wrong. Sounds like the, the government... <laughs> <laughs> All right, this has nothing to do with where we're at in the serial right now. <laughs> oh, no. But we don't. We didn't mention that uh, the Doctor and Joe had a conversation about what the Earth is like in the 30th century. When Joe looks at Solas out of the sky, a window in Skybase, and sees a gray, drab planet, and she says, "Wow, it looks nothing like Earth." And the Doctor mentions, "Well, no, it actually does look like Earth in this era because Earth has been so industrialized and uh, so exploited." that it's just gray and disgusting. I feel like that century. was a, almost a throwback to Colony in Space, because didn't wasn't Colony in Space also set like in the 30th century? I don't know. Or like late tw- eight, late 20s centuries? The late 20s. Tw- <laughs> sounds like the 1920s, but <laughs> I don't know. I don't even remember. <laughs> I, I do remember that we got a date for Colony in Space, but I don't remember what it was. Um... Well, anyway, the doctor's working on the machine now, and then episode five ends with (laughs) Cotton's line that Keon so expertly (laughs) said earlier, like, oh no, we're in the radiation refueling room. That's bad. Um, They're going to need to refuel their ship soon, and we're going to be dosed in radiation. Um, Poor Joe and Kai just trying so hard to react to that line of dialogue. <laughs> well, Katie Manning and uh, oh, whoever. Whoever played Kai. Yeah. Just, just trying so <laughs> hard to react to that line. <laughs> um, you know, I'm surprised Cotton didn't have some sort of mental breakdown when Stubbs died. 
Well, he almost did. He was like on well, the he was verge. On the, he was on the verge of tears. And then Joe was like, come on, Co- uh, Cotton, we got to go. I don't know. I, I really liked uh, Stubbs and Cotton, though. They were awesome. They didn't. They were the best guards on the show so far. Uh, and I'm Including sad to see Stubbs go. Yenton and Bates. Yenton? <laughs> oh, right. That throwback to whatever. Uh, so anyway, the episode six, the administrator shows up. Joe and Cotton escape by climbing into the fuel probe of the administrator's spaceship, which begs the question, oh, like, didn't, <laughs> did it? Here's the first problem with episode six. Didn't the marshal foresee that they could just climb through the fuel probe? Apparently not. Episode six is where it all goes wrong. Um, oh, yeah, we didn't mention, I think this was a scene in episode five. This, has, this also has nothing to do with what's going on currently, but... um. I liked the scene where, I don't know why I liked this, but I liked the scene where the doctor was inser- inserting those uh, clear rods into the thing. Into the device. Yeah, like, I don't know. The smallest mistake could, and then Jaeger almost drops, and he's like, the smallest mistake could blow us up and reverse <laughs> the entire space station. You know, another of the particle reversals magical effects. A third of which is apparently fixing the atmosphere of the planet, even though I don't know how that relates to turning things inside out, but whatever. Yeah, I don't know, I like the scene where he was inserting the things. But yeah, like like I mentioned a minute ago, episode six is where it all just goes to hell. <laughs> so, <laughs> Joe and them escape, um, you know, through the fuel probe. And, and I think, I'm not sure, this is just a nice little touch, I believe, that isn't exactly pertinent to the plot, but makes sense. Because Cotton mentions that they're going to refuel the ship with, uh, I guess, thalassium, I think that's what thesium it was called. Thesium yeah, which is what they were exploiting, what the humans were exploiting Solos for, you know, the the, yeah. the mineral, which is also the thing that causes the thing to happen in episode six. That The mutation. Yeah. yeah. It's which, I, which is a nice touch. What powers the crystal. Yeah. Um, so the doctor's like hanging on to the crystal still because the, he still doesn't quite know what it does, but he thinks that Kai will be able to help figure out what it does, yeah. which is why he went to the space to, uh the sky base but so the investigators arrive the doctor's like at first the marshals pretty much got the doctor saying whatever he wants you know joe is kind of chilling in the radiation room but you know they escape so they show up now the doctor flips sides like yeah i accused the marshal of like and jaeger and jaeger of uh destroying this planet and exploiting it and the investigators are like hmm let's hear your testimony um so- meanwhile sondergaard has gathered up his <laughs> army of mutants because they're can somehow understand him talk and vaguely talk. Yeah, I didn't really go into it, so we don't know for sure whether or not, you know, maybe the mutants are sentient, um, or maybe the, these mutants in particular have only sort of half undergone the transformation. Well, they, full, they fully undergone the physical transformation. It but. is like a transition stage in the transformation, so they've still mostly um, <clears throat> got their brains. But anyway, the... Sondergaard beams up to the station uh, as the doctor is explaining about his and Sondergaard's research, if you can even call it that. Uh, and, uh, well, he busts in, he's like, yeah, this is Sondergaard. He can tell you about the mutations and stuff. And Sondergaard's like, yes, I assume you've told him about how, you know, it's gone wrong. They're like, wait, but I thought this was natural. So then they have another scene where Sondergaard's explaining how <laughs> the experiments caused the mutation to go wrong. And- well, at first, the administrator, uh, well, they they believe the doctor at first, and they say, "Okay, well, uh, yeah, let's see your evidence as to how uh, the marshal and Jaeger have exploited and used this planet." And he says, "Well, uh, it's Sondergaard," and they're like, "Okay, let's go talk to Sondergaard." Well, well, I don't know where he is. So, and then he shows up, and they're like, "Sondergaard!" <laughs> Sondergaard starts explaining. We've got to mention that as soon as the before they actually before Joe and them escaped the and. The investigator basically acquitted the marshal of all crimes and, you know, and then they showed up and all that happens. And then Sondergaard's explaining that a mutant who originally didn't want to use the TMAT system was like, I guess he had a stroke of, I better go see what Sondergaard's doing. And <laughs> he goes up and busts in and then the marshal goes rampage on him and kills him. And then I guess that's enough for the investigator to go, you know what, marshal's right. 
Everybody, release the guards. Just put them under Marshall's command. We've got to kill all these mutants. Release the Kraken. (laughs) Release the Kraken. (laughs) Wonder if we'll ever see the Kraken in Doctor Who. That's like a prime story right there. Yeah, I wish. I you know what I want them to do that I just realized I want them to do something Cthulhu, something with Cthulhu or like the Lovecraft mythos. Well, Cthulhu is a great old one. Oh right, they do do something with Cthulhu. I knew that actually and forgot about it until right now. Um. It's a great old one, like the great intelligence and the <clears throat> animus on the web planet. <laughs> They're never going to do anything cool with the great intelligence, are they? I'm not going to spoil the reboot, but it comes back in the reboot. They're never going to do anything cool with the great intelligence, are they? I think you'll like what they did with the great intelligence in the reboot. Um, mm. um, they actually yeah. make him a formidable opponent. Uh, he was a, they make him he... more of a formidable opponent. Okay. So anyway, yeah, they, they, oh, the Doctor and Sonic Guard escape into the laboratory. Right, I think they explain the transformation process. Well, they don't actually until later. They figure it out in the laboratory because they use the like particle reversal machine the Doctor built earlier to reverse the sphere to analyze the crystal. And they realize that the crystal is the key to the mutation. So he gives it to Sonic Guard to go give it to Kai, who's currently been locked in the radiation room again. But and the marshal shows up. Is like, no, 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 Sonny God, gotta send you to the radiation room. <laughs> Little does he know that it's his downfall. Yeah. So Sonny God gets sent into the radiation room, and like we said, and they Kai is in a state of distress, and they mention that he's even worse than he was the first time he was in the room. Mm-hmm. But I thought this was a little bit strange because the it, maybe I just wasn't paying enough attention. But the first time they were in the room, it didn't look like he was in any sort of distress at all. There was that scene where Cotton sort of helps him into the refueling pod. That might have been it, but I didn't. They well, they either made yeah. it too subtle to notice, or they just didn't do it. And they, I think, they were just kind of referencing the fact that he's been in there before, so the radiation is going to be have a more potent effect on him the second time because he's already had a dose of it, or at least further the effect. Yeah, but anyway, Sonic God gives him the crystal, and meanwhile, in the room, the Doctor is reluctantly building the machine again. Um, and the marshal is all smug and happy. And then Vesica is like, what's going on? Marshal like, you're going to be the first inhabitants of New Earth. We're going to send word to regular Earth that your ship got destroyed on the way here. Lots of all hands. And you're going to be the new colonists. And at this point, it's clear the marshal has gone off the deep end and is not coming back. And he also mentions, and I dislike this. He mentions that, you know, um, he'll be the new ruler of Solos. You know, when the people from Earth come. He's going to be instated as a, as a king or something along those lines. And prior to this, the marshal's plan had just been, you know, get in good with the humans on Earth by doing what they want on Solos and getting power that way. But instead, they just pulled a, ha I'm going to take over the world thing at the end, which I didn't like. Because he wasn't necessarily, he was vying for power. I'm not saying he wasn't power hungry. He was definitely... I think yeah, he, I think he hungry, but. got drunk on power when he, like, when the investigator was like, yeah, better just cede all our troops to him. I think he got drunk on power and realized that why should he, why should he cede to the humans when he can just take over this planet? I mean. Yeah, that's what I, that, I liked that they weren't going for that before. I think, makes, it, but I think makes it makes, sense. I think it makes sense as an evolution of his character. Yeah, I'm not arguing that it doesn't make sense. I'm just arguing that I didn't like it. Okay, but anyway, <laughs> the crystal turns well, the doctor's like, okay, well, I guess I'm going to do this now. And the marshal's like, wait a minute, I don't trust you. Jaeger, take over. <laughs> and Jaeger activates it and blows up in his face. And the marshal's like, oh, you've done it now, doctor. Yeah, the doctor switches the wires, by the way. Same thing he did in the Sea Devils to make everything go haywire. Um, uh, but... <laughs> Oh, no. What? Are we getting to this scene Yeah, the now? crystal, like, oh, activates geez. on Kai. And he... Turns into a mutant, yeah, and the, then he... The process accelerates faster than it ever has been before. He... Because of the cesium <laughs> radiation, because... They give him the crystal. And it also absorbs all the radiation, so it also in the process saves Joe and Cotton. Wait a minute. And so That Gar- name... Wow. I wasn't going to bring that up, but... But anyway, We're not so, going to bring that up. So yeah. um, <laughs> he basically turns into the... Like, I don't know, Jesus, God, Jesus. I don't know. He turns into... He be- I don't be- even want to... He starts becoming all rainbow. 
He can phase through walls now. He can just phase in and out of existence. He flies he, through the ship to he, the marshal and he, just zaps him with a thunderbolt and is like, yep, he you're fl- dead now. <laughs> he fl- on the way there, he flies through some guards and they fall down, presumably dead. He go like you said, he just phases into the chamber where everyone else is, zaps the marshal with some sort of transcendental lightning bolt and Blows him out of existence. Although, to be honest, the Marshal's face when he realizes all is lost was pretty amazing. <laughs> well, the Marshal kind of gets what's coming to him. Yeah, but... I, when I was watching this and I texted you, I was like, yeah, I've never wanted a villain to die so badly <laughs> for so long until right now. Um, but yeah, but it's yeah just... They just, he just transforms into some transcendental being that overpowers everything in the last few s- minutes of the serial, and everything just goes right. Here's the thing. <laughs> it feels like it was pulled out of nowhere, but they had set up the whole, he's gonna evolve and this isn't the final stage of mutation before, but you didn't realize they were gonna go so far <laughs> over the top with that mutation. Exactly. And then, this still begs the question, like, in the spring, do they mutate back into the prior form like do they mutate back into the regular Salonians or well, do they permanently stay in this super OP transcendental <laughs> being state well here's what I thought about it and I'll discuss this before getting into all the things I all the rest of the things I hated about this transcendental form but here's how I rationalized it and this is probably not even true because they don't go into it at all so the transcendent the Salonians are human well my theory is that the Salonians are humans for their the 1500 years of autumn winter and spring and then when summer comes they start transforming into the mutants which is the transition stage the Salonians this the transformation was inspired by um you know things like butterflies right you know the caterpillar yeah, stage and the chrysalis yeah, and then the butterfly um, so they start transforming into the transition stage, which is the mutants, and then eventually, dur- sometime during the summer, slower than what had it, what we saw in this serial, because the experiments expedited the process, they would transform into the transcendental beings. And then yeah. sometime during their seasons are 500 years, so that happens for who knows how many hundreds of years, but then sometime during the fall, they transform back into the human-like state. Um, and I guess over the years, their civil civilization isn't that advanced and they don't really know how to read and keep records anymore. So sometime over the years, they lost the knowledge that this happens, which is why the Salonians don't know why they're transforming and they think it's a bad thing. That was how I tried to rationalize it. Again, I didn't even none try to that... rationalize it. <laughs> I was just like, what? Okay. <laughs> you know what? Whatever. <laughs> well, I don't blame you. But anyway, the final three minutes, um... Of the of the um, serial, they somehow managed to fit in both a Doctor Who question and a pun before the, the end. Right before we get into that, I think we didn't mention that Kai just phases out of existence and thanks the Doctor, and that's an end to that. Well, no, they mentioned that Kai went back down to Solas. Sondergaard mentions it later oh. when Sondergaard's talking about what he's going to do. He said, yeah. Kai went back down to Solas, and he's going to go back down to help Kai uh, work on." Finishing the mutation for all the other Yeah, and Cotton's going to be in control of Skybase. Yeah, and then <laughs> the Doctor and, well, the Doctor and Joe leave and the investigator's like, wait, Doctor Who did you say? <laughs> and then they get to Sector 4, a.k.a. Sector 9, and <laughs> they're about to go into the TARDIS and Joe's like, well, back into the broom closet. And the Doctor's like, guess we made a clean sweep of this, <laughs> eh? And Joe has no reaction, and the dog's like, well, let's go. (laughs) And then we get another announcement over the intercom that there's disturbance in Sector 4, and then it ends. Except in in Cotton's deadpan delivery. Was that Cotton at the end? I thought it was the same American guy who was delivering the thing. No, it sounded like Cotton to me. It sounded like the American guy who who did it before, the American accent that Hmm. they got to... do before. I don't know. Who cares? It's not that important. Episode 6 was just flat-out garbage... But I don't think that it under well. I'll say that yeah, it was they were set up to. Um, it was set up that okay, you, the mutants aren't uh, the final form. You know, they have another mm-hmm. evolution or transformation. That I didn't think that was an ass pull. But like you said, who knew? Who could have possibly guessed they were going for this transcendental being? <laughs> um, 
definitely know, put I a picture it, on the Facebook page this week. Yeah, I I think maybe it could have been better if the the Thessalonians' third form was just a more powerful version of the mutants, and that they just overpowered. Um, the marshal regularly, or that they at least used Kai somehow as evidence to prove that the marshal is destroying the mutants who are actually not supposed. How do I phrase this? He's killing the mutants because of their mute, quote unquote, mutations when it's actually supposed to happen. I don't know why they didn't um, just go that route, but I guess they just wanted to put in some sci fi fantasy stuff, and they did. Well,. It's kind of like they got to the end. We're like, wait, we only have like four minutes. Better make space, Jesus. Better pull. <laughs> better pull. Better pull an episode one. Uh, Star Wars. Anakin's just space oh. Jesus. Better pull a prequel trilogy <laughs> well, and make space Jesus. Well, it's. I wouldn't say it's comparable because there was just that one That's random true, line in Star but, Wars. You don't but, see um, Anakin like. Whatever. <laughs> I don't even want. I'm well, not even anyway, trying to defend this because all the Salonians are just going to become super OP transcendental beings, and from what I just looked up, they never come back. So, so we don't know. It's so, probably for the best. I don't want them to come back after. Well, the yeah, they're kind of OP, and they can phase through things, and you can see them from a mile away because they're rainbows. <laughs> um, there was something else I was going to mention. <clears throat> well, I felt the seal was kind of. Better than mediocre, but not good, great type thing. Just kind of like, eh. Did you feel... Do you I think actually you... came up with the perfect uh, meta simile last night in that the seal felt like a Scooby-Doo episode. You know how Scooby-Doo, there's that scene where they're like going... There's always the scene with the doors and they're going in the doors <laughs> and they come out the other one. That's what the seal felt like because there was that scene where the doctor diverts the power from the team at right as Joe is about to go down to the surface. And then there's the scene where Joe and Kai go down and then the doctor and Varen just miss them and then they go down and they find Kai but they don't find Joe and then they find Joe. Do you have your Joe. Oxy mask on? <laughs> and then they find Joe and then they find Sondergaard. It just felt like there was a lot of just... It was a lot of back and forth and I can understand why someone wouldn't like that. Uh... I don't know, I liked I liked the setting though, so I didn't mind. But what I was going to ask, um, was do you did you feel that you that episode six undermined did you not like the serial because episode six sucked, or did you already no. not like it before? No, I, I already thought it was just mediocre before I even went into episode six. Huh. I see I didn't start like getting into it till episode five. Then I got to episode six, it was like Great. I was like with episode six right until Transcendental Being. I was like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, this is great. This is good. What? <laughs> like, what? Like, well, I don't think the serial really hit its stride till episode five. Like, a lot of it before was like setting up the backstory and setting up the world, which, which isn't liked. a bad thing, but they just spent too long on it. Like, they spent four episodes setting up that Sondergaard had gone missing, but they had found Sondergaard, and there was the tablets that explained the 500-year season that explained why they were mutating, but the mutations weren't because of the atmosphere experiments. <laughs> they spent four episodes just getting that through, and it didn't feel like there was any plot point to that point, because you know the Doctor's just going to stop them from destroying the mutation, but that's all you know is, like... He could have done that just by killing the Marshal at the beginning, so they never really hit... Well, that would have just destroyed the entire serial, but... Exactly. Well, they never really hit the, like, motivation behind anything in the serial till like, episode five. Well, not really. I mean, well, I'll say that I, di I liked what you didn't like about the serial and that they set up the lore and everything. I like that they set I... up the lore. I don't like that they spent four episodes out of six doing it. See, I do, because six episode serials usually feel too drawn out, so rather than have... This one felt too drawn out for me. But I liked that it wasn't drawn out in the sense that maybe Colony in Space was drawn out, where they have a bunch of filler scenes and scenes that didn't necessarily need to be there. Instead, they set up this pretty cool lore with the planet. I like that. Um, I guess and I it just, was interesting. It just felt like they did it in between a lot of scenes that were just based on the doctor having to find someone else to do something. Well, that's what you, that's what the like, quote unquote action or suspenseful scenes in the show usually boil down to. And I at least like like I mentioned before, the pacing felt a little better because there were those interspersed scenes and they don't reveal the mystery right away. 
Uh, so I guess kind of like Scooby-Doo. You know, you only find out who it is in the end, and it's a transcendental space being. No, no, no. <laughs> um, and I think it was just like most of the sequel was the Doctor just being t- kind of just apathetic. He just... What? I don't feel that he way was, at all. He definitely... Well, not apathetic isn't exactly the right word. I think he just Ex- well, didn't do much. He just... Because he had to wait to... Fig- First, he had to figure out who the orb was for. So he was just kind of running around like, oh, there's like a problem. Doesn't matter. Need to find who to give this orb to. And then when he learned that the orb was related to the problem, he's like, oh, got to find Sondergaard because sondergaard has been doing all the research. But lol, nope. You've been trapped with Jaeger. Better find Cotton and Stubbs so they can get you out. I felt like that that was him taking action, though. I didn't feel like that, that was uh, anything different than what we normally do. I mean, he was trying to solve the problem in maybe not in a direct way like in previous serials, but I thought it was kind of nice. I guess. Um, I mean, it wasn't bad serial. I just didn't like it. I just loved episodes one through five, and then episode six is where it all fell apart. <laughs> That's usual with most six episode serials. No, I wouldn't say episode six is where you, most six episode series usually fall apart. They usually fall apart. Well, with I the, fell apart in like, what What was it? The Silurians fell apart in episode six. Well, the, uh, the Silurians are just weird at the end. Uh, Ambassadors of Death kind of fell apart. Ambassadors like in of Death, one. yeah. <laughs> Ambassadors of Death. But I liked, never the, I liked Ambassadors of Death for just going with the fact that it fell apart in episode <laughs> one instead of just. Tr- trying to make it work and then <laughs> falling apart in episode six so it's sort of a it's bad and we know it scenario <laughs> you could like bad stuff we've said this on the show before yeah i mean the entire show is of and questionable you can dislike quality and good i like things it. and that's i dislike the seal but i'm not saying it's a bad serial <clears throat> huh it's interesting um you know there's the fact that we like this show that is definitely of questionable quality uh well yeah, it's, a, it's a whole other discussion uh do we like the show well i don't like how much of it i have to watch <laughs> but <laughs> i'm in too deep already <laughs> hey there's those flashes of yeah i'm totally into this and then there's the flashes of what is happening right now i think this like when you get to like fury from the deep you're like <laughs> why am i even watching this but then you get something like like this and you're like, yeah, for me. Yeah, I was going to say, like, Curse of Peladon or Day of the Daleks or any other serial this season. <laughs> really? This was my... Th- this was... I think episode six doesn't mar the fact that this was, in my opinion, the best Third Doctor serial. My b- favorite Third Doctor serial is still either the Sea Devils or Curse of Peladon. Really? You like the Sea Devils more than the Silurians? Yes. Because I, th- mm-hmm. I think it took the concept and it did it better. Even though it was rehashing a lot of it, I felt it did it better than the Silurians did. I felt it did it slightly worse than the Silurians because of stuff we mentioned in the last episode, so we won't get into that here. Yeah, obviously. Um, but yeah, I my I guess my final analysis of this serial is amazing episodes one through five, and then episode six, just no. Don't want. How about I, if someone were to watch, want to watch this serial? I would probably just recommend that they watch episodes one through five and make up their own ending because whatever they make up, it would be better than what they did in episode six. What and, if the Time Lords just show up and use their whole we can make force fields wherever we want and their super OP other powers to do it? That better than six. Really? <laughs> anything, literally anything, literally everyone explodes and dies is better than what they did in episode six strongly disagree with that <laughs> statement strongly disagree um well email us at the doctor decadent vegetable.com if you have any sort of comment on this serial <laughs> write your own episode six and send it to us good serial didn't like it bad serial loved it whatever you want um check us out on youtube at trust your doctor check us out on itunes at trust your doctor leave ratings if you enjoyed the show leave a rating if you hated the show either works even if you just thought the show was mediocre um and check out the website at decorativevegetable.com uh check us out on facebook at trust your doctor and like us on facebook and next time we will be watching the time monster which is the final serial of season nine so until then the end Uh